I always enjoy talking here in Seattle uh, because it's a receptive audience. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's just much more fun to talk with people who agree with you uh, than those who disagree. But I, I, I should point out that not everybody uh, is, is like-minded. Um, and, and I sometimes even enjoy uh, uh, some people disagreeing with me. And I, uh, middle of uh, last week, I knew I had gotten under the skin of some people when the Wall Street Journal uh, complained about my complaining about inequality. <laughs> uh, they thought there was too little inequality, and I thought there was too much. The, the, what I want to talk about today is, is my, my book, but it's really, uh, the book is about what I've been really passionate about for, for a long time, about the problem uh, facing the United States, the great divide that has opened up. Uh, um, Dow explained some of the dimensions of it here in, uh, in, in King County, but you should understand that you're better than most other parts of the country. Um, the divide in most other parts of the country has gotten uh, much more severe. As he mentioned, uh, my interest was awakened uh, when I was growing up in Gary, Indiana. And, uh, I don't know if you know about Gary, Indiana. It's an industrial town in the southern shore of Lake Michigan that really echoes, uh, traces out the history of industrialization and then deindustrialization in America. It was founded in 1906. It was a real company town. Uh, in fact, probably the most uh, company town in the, in the country. The name Gary, Indiana, is named after the chairman of the board of U.S. Steel. <laughs> uh, and it was the largest integrated uh, steel mill uh, at the time, and, and it's uh, since uh, gone into decline. But when I was there, what I saw was enormous amounts of inequality, extensive racial discrimination, and episodic unemployment. You know, my classmates, parents were out of jobs every three or four years as the economy went into a downturn. What I didn't realize was this was the golden age of capitalism. Uh, this was the best that it got. Uh, that, that's one of the themes I'm gonna come back to, that uh, one of the I ideas that, that our understandings of economics that's changed uh, a great deal was that back then, uh, Simon Kuznick's, who was received a Nobel Prize, uh, is the father of our national income account system, the way we measure GDP, that, that measures everything, as Robert Kennedy said, except that's import what's important. Uh, but uh, it was important for tracing out what was happening to, to the economy. And he, he enunciated uh, what was called a Kuznick's Law. He didn't call it Kuznick's Law, but other people call it a Kuznick's Law. And the idea was that in the early stages of development, inequality would grow. As some parts of the economy took advantage of new technology, new opportunities. And we see that pattern, we saw that pattern in the United States, and we're seeing that pattern today in China. But then, as the parks that were lagging behind caught up, inequality would decline. The United States went through exactly that kind of pattern, and inequality had started to decline beginning in 1929, and, and, and it continued to decline, actually to continue to decline until about 1980. <laughs> and uh, so he, did, he was writing in the middle of the 50s, and he thought, of this as a basic law of economics. Today, we know that's not true. Uh, we know that beginning around 1980, inequality in the United States and in many other countries has increased. And I'll come to in a moment to explain the alternative interpretation uh, of what has gone on. But I wanted to go, uh, tell a little bit about my own story. Having grown up in Gary, Indiana, I. I was motivated to try to understand uh, what gave rise to this uh, high, what I thought was then, high level of inequality. I didn't understand how bad it could get. 
Uh, and so when I went to, the, so I went to Amherst College, uh, I thought I was going to major in physics. Uh, maybe something could have, uh, I could have amounted to something. Uh, <laughs> but uh, my, my passion, my concerns about trying to understand what was going on in inequality led me to MIT to study economics and to um, write my thesis under a great economist, Bob Solo, who himself had, had, uh, had uh, written his thesis on uh, the distribution of income and inequality. I mention this because this was very counter to the main trend in economics. As you know, economists have had a lot of influence in our society. But most, the, the mainstream of economics has taken the view that even talking about inequality is a bad thing. Uh, Bob Lucas, who teaches at University of Chicago, got a Nobel Prize, uh, said just a few years ago that the most vicious, uh, the, the, the worst thing that any economist could do would be to talk about inequality. And sort of echoing the view that Mitt Romney did uh, when he said uh, one should only talk about inequality uh, in closed rooms and quiet voices. You could understand why he might have said that. <laughs> well, uh, out of my thesis, uh, uh, there was a paper published in uh, Econometrica. I don't know how many of you read Econometrica regularly. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, I still modestly think it's, it's, it's an important paper. It's almost 50 years later, and it is still the basic paper laying out the foundations of the determinants of the distribution of income and wealth. But uh, a few years ago, uh, Vanity Fair asked me to write about the subject, and I wrote an article called, that, that really summarizes a lot of what is in this book. Uh, the title of the article was Other 1% for the 1% and by the 1%. Uh, you sort of get the gist of what I was saying. Uh, well, the good news was that that article got a lot more readership than my Econometrica article did. Uh, in fact, uh, it went viral, and that led the New York, New York Times to ask me to, to um, curate a series uh, in the New York Times on the, what we call the Great Divide. And some of those articles that I wrote are, are included in, in here as essays, updated and, and uh, put in context uh, of what has happened uh, in the ensuing time. So what I wanna, want to, to do this evening very briefly is to talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of the new insights uh, that we have into inequality, into the, dimensions, the causes, the consequences, and what we can do about it. Uh, and I'm, as I say, unfortunately, I only have a few minutes, and if you want to find out more about it, you'll have to buy the book or, or borrow it from somebody, because I don't want uh, this to be a private property issue. <laughs> <laughs> so let me discuss a, a, a few ways in which our understanding of inequality has changed uh, very dramatically. First, I mentioned before the, the dramatic change that happened around 1980 and uh, the repeal of Kuznick's law. And there have been two interpretations of this. Uh, one is that World War II was, brought the country together. We had fought the war together. That resulted in a kind of national cohesion that uh, uh, let, you know, it was a period where we, of our fastest economic growth, but it was a period of shared prosperity. Every group in the country grew, but those in the bottom grew faster than those at the top, so we, we converged. Now, just as statistics, many of you may not know this, uh, but the top tax rate, the top marginal tax rate at the time was 91%. Now, if you listen to some people today, you would say at 91%, the economy must have been falling apart. No one was working. <laughs> it just wasn't true. It was, as I say, the period of our greatest, uh, fastest economic growth. Well, uh, 
came the the seventies. We went through a very difficult period in our country. There were uh, there was the oil price shocks, uh, uh, Vietnam War, and uh, it seemed for a while that our economic model wasn't working. And some people advocated trying another approach, and that was called supply side economics. Those of us who studied economics thought this was a bonkers idea. Uh, but you could understand the sort of the logic. The logic was you lower tax rates, and that would provide more incentives. They lowered it down to 35 percent, a lot lower than the uh, actually below 35, almost down to 30 percent, a lot lower than the 91 percent. And you combine that with deregulation, taking away the constraints, and the two together would was supposed to, to lead to a burst of economic growth. And yes, they realized that there would be more inequality, uh, that um, doing this would, would uh, lead the people in the middle and the bottom to get a smaller share of the economic pie. But the argument was the pie would get so much bigger that everybody would benefit, uh, even those in the middle and the bottom. Well, we've now had a third of a century of this experiment. And we should be able to judge. And when we look at what's happened, part of the forecast was right. We did get more inequality. <laughs> but that was the only part of the forecast that turned out uh, correct. We grew more slowly, so much more slowly that in fact, in the middle, there has been essentially stagnation. Today, incomes are lower, adjusted for inflation, than they were 25 years ago, a quarter century ago. But this is an average of across different demographic groups. One demographic group that I have some empathy with is males. And the median income of a full-time male worker is lower than it was 40 years ago. So there's four, four decades of stagnation. But at the bottom, things are even worse. As most of you know, in the country as a whole, the minimum wage is lower, adjusted for inflation, than it was 45 years ago. And can you imagine a half century in which those at the bottom have seen no increase in their standard of living? A half century during which, you know, actually over just the last 35 years, China has moved 500 million people out of poverty. The biggest change in, in, in a sense in a global era. Um, and in the middle, incomes have increased eightfold. And in that era, that same period, we increased not only the numbers of people in poverty, the percentage of people in poverty. So, if an economic system doesn't deliver for most of, of the citizens, something is wrong with the economic uh, system. If we have an experiment that has failed that badly, we ought to think about maybe trying something else. So that was um, one of the hypotheses of, of uh, uh, so one of the hypotheses of what happened beginning in 1980 was that social cohesion after World War II began to erode after uh, uh, several decades. The other one is we tried a flawed experiment. I'll come back to these themes a little bit later. The second big idea that uh, uh, new understandings of inequality was, uh, and Dow uh, ex expressed this uh, quite forcefully, it used to be thought that Yes, inequality might be a bad thing, but if we were to do anything about it, we'd have to pay a high price. We'd have to give up on economic growth, economic performance, in some important dimension. We now understand that the two are complements, not substitutes, that we can have more economic growth and less inequality. This used to be, a, you know, people like me argue this, have argued this for a long time, but now this has actually become a mainstream view. The International Monetary Fund, the IMF, not known as an exactly liberal organization. 
in fact, as many of you know, it, it represents the views of the, uh, to a large extent of financial markets. They have pointed out and have argued all over the world that inequality, especially when it achieves the level that, and the form that it does in the United States, is actually bad for economic growth. Uh, I wish, you know, uh, uh, more government uh, people, uh, our political leaders, would, would listen to the IMF on this score. Uh, so, uh, this is such a different view than Art Oaken, who was uh, uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under uh, President Johnson, wrote a very famous book called The Big Trade-Off, where he talked about this trade-off, and today we realize that's no longer true. A third big idea relates two concepts, one of equality of income and outcomes on the one hand, and the other one of equality of opportunity. When the debate about inequality first began to heat up in the United States, there were some people like uh, Ryan, uh, Representative Ryan, who said, we don't care about inequality of outcomes. The America uh, way, uh, American, Americans care about equality of opportunity. That's what's really important. Well, the fact is that not only does the United States have the highest level of inequality of income of any of the advanced countries, but it has among the lowest level of equality of opportunity. And that's so different from the way we see ourselves and the way others see us. What that means is that the life chances of a young American are more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in other advanced countries. So I tell my student, the most important decision that you have in your life is to choose the right parent. <laughs> and if you make that decision wrong, the game is all over. And you see this in so many different ways. For instance, uh, if you look at a child born in the top half who does poorly in school, he'll wind up with a higher income than somebody from the bottom half of our population who does well in school. Uh, you know, it used to be said that if you work hard and plays by the rules, you'll, do a, go a, you'll, you'll get ahead. Not true in America. And what's so striking is it's much better in the other advanced countries, including the old Europe that we used to think of as being so class-ridden and so rigid, they've actually recognized their problems and they've tried to change the way, the way they've organized their society. And they've succeeded to a large extent. Not perfectly, but they've succeeded uh, to a large extent. The fourth idea I want to emphasize, and that turns out to be really important, is that there is a huge variation in the levels of inequality across different countries in the world. And even in the direction of change. In some countries, inequality has actually been coming down. Now, why is that important? That's important because the economic forces at play are the same all over the world. They're global. Technology, globalization affect essentially all countries around the world, particularly all advanced countries around the world. But the way these forces play out seem to be very different. And what that means, it's about our policies, about how we've shaped our economy and our society. And that, in turn, means it's about politics. And I'll come to that in, in, in a second. But let me try to illustrate uh, some ways in which we, we shape uh, our economy, we shape our society. If you have more monopoly power, then the monopolists can raise their prices. And if you have weaker protection of workers, weaker unions, then that bargaining power can drive down uh, wages. People here in Seattle recognize that back in 1999, 98, when you had what is uh, sometimes called the Seattle riots, <laughs> uh, the protests about WTO. 
And why would they protest? There were many issues. There was environment, there were concerns about developing countries, there were concerns about workers. But all of this was about how do we set the rules and regulations of legal frameworks which govern our, our economy. And that if you, if the, globalization is an abstract force, but the way you shape globalization can lead to more inequality. Right now, the country is involved in a very big debate, or ought to be involved in a debate. The, the president tried to slide it through with nobody noticing, and, and that's about the Trade Promotion Authority and TPP, the Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership. Partnership is a euphemism. Um, there's one partner that's bigger than the others. And uh, a transatlantic agreement. You know, those of us who believe in democracy think you ought to have an open debate about the issues. For some reason, the administration, in particular the USTR, doesn't believe that. So the negotiating positions of the U.S. are not only kept secret, they're stamped secret. They've been made a national security secret. Now, it's not about national security. It's about bargaining positions. It's about the fact that corporate interests have a seat at the table. They get to see the U.S. bargaining position because they want to make sure that it is consistent with ways that will increase their profits. But NGOs, civil society, even congressmen have been having trouble getting a hold of it. Now, how, do you, how can I be so adamant about that it's a bad agreement? Well, the great news about America is that everything leaks. <laughs> of course, the back side of this is that NSA is listening to everything, including what I'm talking about now. <laughs> so the, the, we know from the leaks, and the, and the US, uh, USTR and the president haven't denied anything about those leaks, that, that this trade agreement would, for instance, increase the power of big pharma, the drug companies, over generics. And the real irony of that is that Obama has made health care Obamacare, the signature achievement of his administration. But these provisions in the trade agreement will drive drug prices up because it will weaken competition from generics. And Americans and people all over the rest of the world, are going, uh, the Pacific, are going to have to pay higher drug prices if this agreement goes through in the way that the, the U.S. government is negotiating. Uh, the way our economy functions uh, has a lot to do, as I say, with the rules and regulations. Here in the, in the Northwest, people value the environment, and uh, uh, the agreement has provisions that would make it very difficult to regulate to protect the environment. There's a particular provision that, uh, called the investment agreement uh, which is particularly uh, pernicious because what it says is that if any country, including the United States, changes a law in ways that reduce the profits that a firm would have expected to have, the government has to compensate. And the trial doesn't occur in a public court. One of the basic aspects of our society is that judicial process is a basic part of government. But they privatize it. It goes to an ex expensive group of private lawyers who act as arbitrators. My concerns about this are not just hypothetical. We've seen these suits. And let me just share with you one example of something that's important, but it, it affects one aspect of inequality, health inequality, but there are many, many other aspects of, of inequality, including regulations about, about our financial system that we found out weren't so good. And you change those regulations, and again, you invite a suit. And let me tell you, 
countries ha are really, those who have already signed these kind of agreements are now worried about what will happen if they change their financial regulations. So this particular provision is, a, to me, a very interesting one. Uh, back in the 19th century, uh, there was a big trade imbalance between the West and China. China had a lot of goods that the West wanted. Uh, in particular, they had porcelain, China. <laughs> but there are a lot of other things. Whereas the West did not have very many goods that China wanted. And there developed a big trade imbalance until Europe figured out a way of solving the problem. And that was uh, a good that had a property that we in the business school at Columbia and all other business schools say is a great property, uh, repeat purchases. And that, of course, was opium. Um, one of the things about opium is once you buy it, you, come, you tend to buy it again and again and again. China figured out this wasn't so good, and uh, they said, no thank you, we don't want any more of your opium. And the West said, you're interfering with a basic right of free trade. And not only did they say it, they went to war. They went to war twice, what are called the opium wars. And they won, they opened up the market, the first open market initiative, uh, to, to opium, and they also took away a lot of the concessions uh, on the east coast of, of China. Well, uh, you may not know this, but your government is waging the 21st century opium war. Uh, it's not opium this time, of course. It's a product that is addictive, made deliberately addictive. Again, good property for those who are interested in making money, repeat purchases and uh, destroys health. And that, of course, is cigarettes. Uh, two countries, Uruguay and, um, Uruguay and, and uh, Australia, passed a law uh, regulating cigarettes. Not a very strong law, very similar to the United States, where you said you had to label uh, cigarettes as being hazardous to your health. They went a little one step further. They had pictures of lungs that were destroy, uh, destroyed by the cigarettes. Uh, the problem was that these labels actually worked. <laughs> and many people were discouraged from uh, buying cigarettes. Philip Morris was not very happy. And they said, well, you're destroying our profits. The profits that we would have expected because we expected more people to buy our cigarettes until they died. Um, and under a provision essentially identical to the provision that the president is insisting on having in the trade agreements, Philip Morris is suing Uruguay and Philip Morris. And if they win, Uruguay and Australia will have to either stop the labeling or compensate Philip Morris for, not, for, for this regulation. And the legal costs are enormous. In the case of Uruguay, a poor you know, South American country, it can't afford the legal costs. So fortunately, some well-off Americans like Bloomberg and Gates are paying for the cost of Uruguay defending itself. Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine a situation where Americans have to pay to f defend other countries against what our government has framed as as a basic right of com of companies to be able to sell poisonous products? And this is just one example of many, many regulations that will be undermined the trade agreement that the President Obama is pushing. Um, and trying to get a blank check that can be used not only by the current president, but the next president, whoever that is, in 2016. And we don't know what the Congress is. We don't know what the next president is going to be. We hope we know, uh, but, but we don't know. And he's asking for a blank check that will go on for years and years and years. Well, the point I want to make is 
laws and regulations shape our economy. And in shaping the economy, they shape the degree of inequality. And that's why the U.S. has more inequality than other countries. Now, it's not a question about what we can afford. Some people say, you know, uh, we can't afford to do, to take the actions that would lead us to have more equality. I think that's absolutely wrong. Just go back to the period that I mentioned before, the period right after World War II. We were then a much poorer country. It was 70 years ago. And in 70 years, we've grown. But at the end of World War II, what did we say? We said that everybody who had fought in the war, which was every able-bodied man and a lot of women, had the right to a free four-year college education to the best education that they could get into. If they got into Harvard, if they got into a community college, whatever they could get into, our nation paid for it. Today, when President Obama proposed that we have two-year community colleges for our poorest Americans, many conservatives said we can't afford it. Now, is it a question that we can't afford it? No, it's obviously not a question. It's a matter of choice. And this is one of the real themes that I try to bring out in the book. The inequality that we have is a result of the choices that we've made. When I say we've made, it, our political system. And that brings me to the next point. When you have the level of inequality, economic inequality that we have, it almost inevitably translates into political inequality. To the point where we now have a system that's better described as one dollar, one vote, than one person, one vote. We have a kind of, and it, it gets even worse because as they get, uh, as, a, as, as the money influences our political system, it influ just as it influences the rules of the economic game, it influences the rules of the political game. So it, we are the country where money talks the loudest in the political sphere. We are a country where corporate, uh, Citizens United corporations can give unlimited amounts of money for campaign contributions. Where the last election, each candidate spent over a billion dollars. And this election is expected to cost a lot more. And when people, when, when corporations make what are called campaign contributions, these are not charity. They view these as investments. And when our banks made these investments, these investments were better than any of their financial investments. Those were a disaster. But their political investments really paid off, both in deregulation, in the bailouts, and then more recently in preventing the re-regulation that our country needed. Well, I've talked a lot about inequality at the top. I've talked a little bit about the growth of inequality uh, at the bottom, the increase in poverty. But as the uh, introduction to my talk pointed out, the real problem, a, a, a real problem in the United States is the evisceration of the middle. And he described how here in Seattle, which is one of the better performing places, all of the growth has been at the top and the bottom but the middle class is shrinking. You know, that's reflected both in the fact that incomes in the middle adjusted for the inflation are stagnant for a quarter century, but it's also in that a smaller and smaller fraction of the population is plus or minus 50% of that middle income. And more, more people are moving into the bottom and the top tails. After World War II, the United States was successful in creating the first middle-class society. And the country was being brought increasingly together. But again, since 1980, and especially since the year 2000, the basic uh, attributes, what, what, what defines a middle-class lifestyle, are increasingly moved, being moved out of reach for a larger and larger number of Americans. The kind of retirement security, home ownership of the kind of home that they would like to have, 
um, uh, sending their kids to college. All of these, you might say, almost basic necessities are becoming uh, increasingly difficult. Take the issue of education, which is so important uh, for getting ahead. Uh, what's happened here in, in, in Washington reflects what's happening in so many other places around the country. Cutbacks of support for uh, universities and colleges have led to tuition soaring. The combination of soaring tuition and declining or stagnant incomes in the middle has meant the only way that you can get ahead is by borrowing. Student debt is now over a trillion dollars larger than credit card debt. It's affecting the way our economy functions in fundamental ways. Other countries have solved the problem in other ways. Australia has an income contingent loan program available for all the students so they can borrow, but what they pay depends on their income. So if they decide to go into teaching, teaching high school, they know their income is going to be low, but the amount that they pay back is just commensurately. Whereas in, for so many young Americans, they feel their choices are constrained. They have to accept a job as a bank or a corporate lawyer when that's not really their passion, for good reason. And <laughs> because it's the only way that they'll be able to pay back the crushing loans. The average student graduating from college now has uh, $25,000 debt, but if you go on to graduate school, the numbers are more like 100,000, in some cases, $200,000. Well, the final point I want to raise before I open it to question is that these problems that I've described won't be solved. There's no magic bullet. There's no, the, the problems have been, been growing for a quarter, for, for a third of a century. Uh, and so uh, there's nothing that we can, there's no magic bullet, nothing we can do that will correct it right away. But if we don't begin, things will get worse and worse. We've seen the trajectory that our economy is on. An economy where we have growing and increasing inequality, where, for instance, eight people who inherited their wealth have more wealth than the bottom 44% of the country, uh, and exercise that wealth uh, in the political sphere to try to make sure that they can, that, that others can't climb up. <laughs> uh, so it's really important for us now to recognize that minor tweaks in the system won't solve the problem. It is really important to increase the minimum wage. It is really important to increase educational opportunities. But unless we address some of the more fundamental structural problems that have led us to be the, most, the, the economy with the most inequality, we're just addressing the symptomatic problems we aren't getting at the root causes. So that's why I think it's just imperative that we begin to discuss what are the root causes and figure out what to do about it. But I also think that we can't wait to solve the problem that, as I say, is going to take literally to correct the mistake of the, that's been accumulating for a third of a century. It will take another 20, 30 years. And in the meanwhile, I think we have to take actions to make sure that a middle class lifestyle is accessible to the majority of our, of our citizens. So I just want to end uh, on, on this note of urgency. Uh, 35 years ago, we began this grand experiment, which anybody with an inkling of uh, a scientific background would say has been a dismal failure. We, ought to, we have to change. And uh, we can't go on as business as usual. I hope uh, discussions like this, town hall meetings all over the country, will, will be part of a process of bringing about th that kind of change, um, that we will take this uh, course, not of accepting business as usual, continuing the course we've been on for a third of a century, but really going into the different course 
that will enable us to restore the kind of society that we had, the kind of social cohesion that we had uh, in the decades after World War II. Thank you. How important do you believe that unions are and continue to be uh, towards maintaining the middle class? In this state, we have a very worrisome problem. There is a big movement to turn the state into a right-to-work state. What suggestions, what help do you think? I, th I think that would be a big mistake. And unions have played an important role in uh, as part of, you might say, our systems of checks and balances. One of the things I didn't have time to talk about was the issues of corporate governance and the power of, of executives. One of the uh, really, truly outstanding facts of inequality in the United States is the growth of CEO pay relative to those of average citizens. Used to be 20 to one, now uh, is closer to 301, uh, and that increase is not because they suddenly got more productive. Uh, the, the bank CEOs got huge bonuses, not because, and even after 2008, when they brought the banks and our country to the brink of ruin, they walked off with huge bonuses. So what we have come to understand is that it's not just competitive forces in the way that you learned about that in your elementary textbooks that are driving the inequality in the United States, but it's, it's you might say, a balance of power. And right now, we have an imbalance. And uh, really, the voice of workers is not being adequately heard. And it's not heard in, in lots of different form. I mean, for instance, uh, one of the issues I... Uh, is the Federal Reserve. Uh, monetary policy affects, supposed to affect output, inflation, and employment. Uh, that's supposed to be the mandate to look after all three of those. But there's nobody representing workers. A lot of people representing the banks and the financial sector. And so you get an imbalance between a concern about inflation and a concern about unemployment. Some other countries that are much better performing have always a representative from workers on the Federal Reserve, on their equivalent of the Central Bank, the Federal Reserve Board. So unions are the way that workers get together in some sense and try to, to reflect the interests and concerns of workers. Um, you know, there are imperfections in unions, just like there are imperfections in corporations. I mean, no, no human inst institution is perfect. So, you know, we, we know that there were lots of problems in the past. Unfortunately, the union's force, uh, strength has been diminished to the point where it's uh, about 10% of the labor force. Again, some people said that this is a, the natural evolution. It's not true. Other countries that have experienced just as much globalization, just as much technology, have a much greater voice of workers, and one of the reasons why they have more equality. So it's again, it's the way we shape our, our economy and our society. There was a book that came out over a year ago by Thomas Piketty. One of, one of the things he brought book. up was one of the things he brought up was that from the progressive era, era until about yes, about 1980, that it, it was our economic results were mostly an anomaly, and that what we're doing is returning to what we were, maybe we naturally are we were in the 17th and 18th centuries. Yeah. So I, I actually did talk about that in my book uh, very explicitly. Uh, a, a couple of the essays were, in some sense, res written in response to, to Piketty. The title of this book is Capital in the 21st Century. And the main thesis is precisely what you said, that inequality is, the re is the, basically the natural workings of the capitalist system. And it's the accumulation of capital that's driving this inequality. Uh, and the real anomaly was what I call the golden age of capitalism uh, of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, I argue that he's wrong, that it's not about capital in the 21st century, it's about democracy uh, in the 21st century, and that it's the way we shape 
the economic system, and that we can have a market economy, let me say a market economy, where, which, where markets actually work, work like markets are supposed to, where you have less market power on the part of monopolies, where you don't have the CEOs having the kind of uh, say over the division of the, of, the, of the corporate pie that they have, um, a whole set of, of uh, deviations from textbook economics that have driven inequality to the extent that it is. So, so my view is he's right in documenting, documenting the magnitude of inequality, but the interpretation of, what, what, of that, I think he's wrong, uh, that I'm much more hopeful that we can do something about it if we can get our politics right. A shift of power to capital took place, and it, that power was able to implement the policies that have produced the inequality, and we didn't have a successful uh, Soviet Union to uh, scare the capitalists as FDR did in the 30s. So isn't it really a lack of a, a viable socialist alternative that is the problem here? Well, I, I think, I, I think uh, it is uh, the uh, framework that has uh, been uh, failed to be able to check the uh, development of the uh, of of uh, the power, you might say, of of the one percent. Uh, and I use that as a metaphor because a lot of people in the one percent are are actually uh, worried about what has been happening to our our, our society. Um, the uh, and, and what I've been trying to describe is how changes in the rules and regulations have uh, have have. Uh, uh, affected uh, uh, this change in the market power uh, of, mono of monopoly, the weakening of, the, uh, of, of unions. Um, I tell in the beginning of, of my book uh, uh, an, uh, an interesting story that reflects what happens when you don't have the, the check of, co of real competition across economic systems. And I think that point that you make there is, is relevant. I, I was at a dinner party um, of uh, 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 somebody, you know, in New York, we, we divided between the east side, uh, west side, between uh, east of Central Park and west of Central Park. And, and it's a little bit of a caricature, but it's still true that uh, they're different cultures. Uh, and the east side, for those of you who don't know, is, is where the bankers uh, live. Uh, and the west side is where the publishers and the musicians uh, and Columbia University uh, is. So, uh, but uh, I do get invited uh, uh, across uh, the park uh, occasionally. And I got invited across the park uh, by uh, a, somebody very wealthy who, who was very concerned about the growth of inequality and she decided to have a dinner party and decided to invite a few academics and uh, uh, a number of billionaires, multi-billionaires. Um, it was an interesting, it was an interesting uh, evening um, marked by, you know, uh, kinds of conversation that were really memorable as, as one of the people who had inherited a few billion dollars was saying, you know, how, how about lazy people. And then... <laughs> And then he went on, you know, the people who shirked, and, and, and then he went on and talked about, uh, with the, the guy sitting next to him, about where is the best place to hide your money. Uh, was the Cayman Islands better than uh, some other offshore uh, uh, center? Um, but then the conversation went on to uh, a refrain that got heard several times in the evening, which was, remember the guillotine. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, which was a refrain back, of course, to those of you who know, to back to, to uh, uh, the French Revolution. And what was so interesting, it wasn't a sense of compassion that was motivating uh, the discussion, except for themselves, I think. Um, it wasn't a sense of what is a just society. It was we have to remember not to be too greedy because we aren't very many 
and, uh, 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 and, and, and there are limits of how much uh, of the pie that we can take for ourselves. Um, and so, in a sense, that is part of one of the things, and I saw that in, in the context of development of the way we treated countries in Africa and elsewhere, when there was competition, we treated them a lot better uh, than when the era of competition uh, ended. And uh, I think there's an important lesson from that. We have time for one or two more questions. Well, thanks. Um, does the term fascism, defined by Mussolini as the marriage of corporation and state, resonate with you? You know, especially regarding uh, policies and Supreme Court decisions and uh, data-driven police states? Okay. Well, fortunately, we're not down that far. Uh, Are you sure? Uh, <laughs> I better say, last question. <laughs> Hi, I'm Blythe. Um, we are so grateful that you've come here, and I represent a group of PhD students from the University of Washington studying pharmacoeconomics, and together we have a question for you. So we absolutely love your 1973 paper with Rothschild establishing the pooled and separated equilibrium for health insurance. And so what we wanted to know is how do you, just wait you guys, it's important. <laughs> how do you predict, uh, what do you predict is going to be the effect of the Affordable Care Act of Obamacare in changing inequality based off of this equilibrium? Okay, well, uh, I think the affordable, you know, the, the, the dis distinguishing aspect of America is that it, has been the only advanced country that has not recognized the right to access to health care as a basic human right. Uh, and uh, it shows up, the fact that we, we, we don't recognize, it shows up in the statistics uh, that in terms of average life expectancy, we do much poor, more poorly than countries that spend a lot less money, um, that we spend about 17% of GDP. Uh, there are countries like Australia that spend 8% of GDP, but their life expectancy is uh, three years longer uh, than the United States. But you look within the United States uh, at uh, the um, life expectancy of people who are at the bottom even something broad like those women who have not graduated from uh, high school. And it's 10 years shorter than those who uh, managed to graduate from college or, or from the rest of the average Americans. Um, I was, uh, I have to tell a little story. I was, uh, uh, Sarkozy, President Sarkozy uh, of France visited Columbia in the midst of the Amer Affordable Care Act debate Obamacare uh, debate, and uh, a student uh, a asked him, uh, what do you think of, of Obamacare, you know, of the bill? And he first hesitated and he says, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to comment on your domestic uh, uh, disputes. Remember, Sarkozy is on the right in France. He just went, <laughs> so anyway. And then he couldn't help himself, but he, said, he went on to say, I just don't understand you Americans. Uh, we view, we on the right in France view access to health care as a basic right. We can't imagine the way that you've approached health care. Now, I think uh, there are two aspects of, of Obamacare. Um, one of them was that it would extend access it's been undermined by the fact that a large number of stakes, including the stakes that have been where the, the need is greatest, have turned down uh, Medicaid expansion. And so they've totally undermined, and the Supreme Court said that uh, undermined the, 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 the mechanism that was put into the law to try to cajole states to providing uh, health care for their poor citizens. So that part 
you know, just was undermined by the Supreme Court. And so there won't be equal access in the southern uh, states in the United States. Um, the second thing was that it was intended to bring down cost. I think it will do that uh, to some extent. But in getting that agreement, Obama made some compromises uh, that allowed monopoly power to continue in the health insurance industry. It allowed monopoly power to continue in the pharmaceutical industry. And one of the reasons why Americans pay much higher uh, drug prices than others anywhere else in the world. And as I said earlier, I am very worried and am befuddled why Obama is trying to push a trade agreement which will lead to higher drug prices for Americans and for countries all over uh, other members of the trade, uh, trade agreement. Now, over the long run, uh, what, what she was asking about is, uh, my earlier work raised some real problems of, of what are called adverse selection, of problems that, that when you're an insurance company, uh, the best way of increasing your profits is to make sure that you don't insure people who are going to need the insurance. <laughs> um, and they spend a lot of money uh, to figure out how to do that, and they're very clever. And uh, so, so uh, you know, the, 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 the implication of that is I am not, over the long run, optimistic that this kind of patchwork that we did to try to keep an old system going rather than reforming it to a single payer system, recognizing, <laughs> you know, recognizing that that system is broken. And I mentioned before that, uh, you know, how much evidence do you need? The uh, experiment in supply side economics, 35 years old, uh, has been a failure. Our system of private health insurance has been going on longer, and uh, it's a more dismal failure. So I think uh, eventually we will have to force uh, to think about alternatives. And, and uh, there are alternatives that are working so much better than ours. Thank you so much.